So uh, I'm going to ask Jeff to come up. It's my pleasure to introduce him. And when he gets here, I'm going to give him a memento of this occasion. I'm going to give him his very own Roosevelt University. Oh, yeah. All right, so please, please welcome Jeff Patrick. Government is always good, not that it's ever nearly perfect, 
but that it makes us all what we became. Without it, with an attitude that government is guilty until proven innocent, the problem, never the solution, America has taken major steps backward. And it's always a little hard for me to talk to student groups because I don't want to sound too pessimistic. But nations do fall off the cliff. Maybe that's not quite the right image. They walk off the cliff. Or they slowly roll down a gradual hill. We could be doing that in the United States today. And the reason we might be doing that is because of our lost faith in government. So for me, the opportunity, and as a writer uh, most of my life in public, uh, and a little bit on television, in fact, you kind of left out the fact that I was an NBC correspondent for about 10 minutes. Um, uh, I had not had the opportunity I now have to develop a real initiative, a project, along with people like Sarah, to restore faith in government in the United States. And that is the purpose of this project, Rediscovering Government. It is to change the discourse from the one-sided, anti-government, ideological hold that, I, that has gripped America, the media, even academia, we have to try to get beyond it. That's why we started this program. I want to talk a little bit, as I say, about three major issues that are close to me. One is the misconception, and we're going to go a little into a little more detail on that with a, a more detailed timeline when we show up there. The misconception that America was always a very small, unobtrusive, unintrusive government country. It's just not true. There would be no America with that government. The role of government is not determined by the amount of dollars the government spends. It's regulation, it's law, it's legal precedent. And all of that started indeed well before the Constitution was even signed. We were a highly regulated colonial nation in the late 1700s. We had indentured servants. That was regulation. We had all kinds of custom duties, all kinds of excise taxes. This was not a government that did not exist. But it was a nation that broke away from government that broke away from a dictatorship and had deep in its heart a desire to believe in individualism and a kind of freedom that the world had mostly not known before. And it achieved that. But it did not achieve that without government. It achieved that hand in hand with government. Government was the protector of that kind of freedom and the fosterer of that kind of freedom the creator of opportunity, the creator of talent. And as I say, it started a long time ago. One of the things that bugs me the most, and bug is a euphemism for a nastier word, is this idea, and President Obama said it something like it once again in the last debate, that government is not a job creator. Only business is a job creator. Government is a job creator. When government educates you, they're creating a job. When they build enough roads to get you to work or get your business to operate efficiently so it can get its goods around, they're creating jobs. When they get to do research, they're creating jobs. When they ask you to join one, uh, and become a member of the armed services, they are educating you and training you and usually sending you back into the nation to contribute yet again. They are creating jobs. When they build highways, when they subsidize railroads, when they create health care systems, they are creating jobs. Did government do this? Was government a tiny little thing even under Jefferson? As you all know, Jefferson doubled the size of the nation by unconstitutionally buying the Louisiana territories. Probably the single most important decision made by a president 
in our history. Uh, Thomas Jefferson is by and large opposed to public works, but even he planned railroads. What I think most interesting about Jefferson was that he demanded regulation over the sale of land well before he was president. They were federal government, first the states owned most of the land in America. Then the, they had to cede it to the federal government with the, coming of the, with the signing of the Constitution. How would that land be sold to you and me? Jefferson and others, Jefferson among their, the leaders, uh, demanded regulations to make sure ultimately the land was sold cheaply and to a large degree fairly. A Perhaps, and many, many historians argued this for years, the most important single fact about America was the ownership of land, the widespread ownership of land. Now, sometimes that's mythologized, of course. But perhaps in the colonial years, half of Americans owned their own land. That's a stunning number compared to what that number was in the old world. Half could often support themselves at a subsistence level without dependence on government. But that did not happen alone, especially as the country grew older. That happened with the help of regulation. It was not mere money. One of my favorite facts, in fact, is that under Andrew Jackson, you know, you know any squad? I actually knew squatters in New York City. It's hard to imagine that young people squatted in buildings in New York City. But in the 1980s, there were squatters. I, I shouldn't admit this, but I even dated a young woman that was squatting in a brownstone. On a street I subsequently lived on, which became a very cheap street. Andrew Jackson insisted that squatters' rights be retained. I'm oversimplifying this history a little bit. Insisted that people who went out and said, I, I'm on this piece of land, I don't think they had a little piece of cotton string, that, that they certain, uh, that they, um, marked out their piece of land. Jackson supported rights of those squatters to keep that land. It was a government, democratic government issue in the 1830s. Quite extraordinary kind of radical government attitude. So let's go quickly over what the government did. Regulation for land, on land, really important. Subsidy and financing of the canal. The canals were vital to early commerce. Jefferson didn't do it. The states, Jefferson's own party in the states led by New York did it. Subsidies of the canals. Sub and, and financing of the canals, actually the outright building of the canals. Subsidies of the railroads, even before the Civil War. The most extraordinary achievement, the development of public schools. Are we going to go through this? Oh, okay. We actually have a, a cheat sheet so that I don't, I don't forget too much. Should we do the present? Okay, let's do it. Think about that. The, the Constitution was signed 1789. I'm getting, I'm getting old, so I probably get these dates mixed up. In the 1830s, local government started developing free, high-quality education for primary school students. By 1850, 1850, America had more kids of primary school age in attendance than France or England, and as much as Prussia, the leading nation of its time in education. It spent as much per pupil as, those, as Prussia did, and more than Germany, and more than France and England. Extraordinary achievement, mandatory free public education. For a while, there was a tuition payment. And state governments knocked it out. They said, no, we want people to go for free. Massachusetts was the leading state in that area. Extraordinary, you know. It wasn't written in the Constitution, you know. And the schools were not built by General Electric. They were built by UNB taxpayers. They were built by government. After the Civil War, there were great subsidies of the railroads. Uh, not always above board, not without corruption but vital to the development of the nation. The railroads exploded. One area utterly forgotten, I forget that I have this cheat sheet. What, what am I leaving out here? In any case, onward. One area that we don't talk about very much is health subsidies all the way back into the 1800s. 
government supplied the vaccines. Maybe as important, government at state and local level sanitized the cities, sanitized the water. New York City was among the leaders. We had running water in New York City early. We had clean water. Without clean water, there wouldn't have been great cities. We would have died of disease. Without great cities, there wouldn't have been great economies. A factor often left out in economic growth theory. But cities created demand poles that led to economic growth. Jane Jacobs is a much better historian in this regard than many of the growth economists we read about or learn in school. Sanitation, don't forget it, because it is always left out. And then came the high schools. We didn't get high schools from the Native Americans. We built the high schools. We realized we needed a more educated population, number one. And the population realized it needed more education to get good jobs. And by the early 1900s, we had a very high proportion of teenagers graduating high school. And we started building roads. We started building all those things in the 1930s, some of which you saw in our earlier presentation. Government did that in the 1930s when we thought we were broke. We thought we were broke. We worry about being broke now and we can't do anything. The difference is we don't do anything now. And then we did do things we needed. We did build what we needed. After World War II, the cliches uh, have already developed. The internet, government finance, the huge highway system. Uh, but for those of you who don't know, the highway system was not sold as a great infrastructure project. It was sold as a security project to make sure we could defend ourselves against the, the Russians are coming. The Russians are coming. Anybody here under 25 see that movie? Pretty funny. I think it's still funny. Uh, we, put the, we put Sputnik, uh, when Sputnik went up, we started investing aggressively in education, and we decided we eventually could put a man on the moon. And we did that. I remember watching one, Meet the Press or one of those shows, and James Carville's wife, whose name I must block out for some reason. Um, yes. <laughs> no, Mary Madeline. Talked about who is Armstrong died recently, the man who was the first man on the moon. And she said, Paul, oh, now there is an American story. He did what he wanted to do. He became this great person strict will, intelligence, courage. What she left out were the tens of thousands of workers at NASA who put him on the moon. Didn't enter her mind. She made it sound like it was some great act of individualism. This may sound a little bit pompous, a little bit broad, and a little over philosophical, but there are no great acts of individualism. Nobody does one darn thing alone, not one even in the most highly individualistic societies. We stand on each other's shoulders, but we don't stand only on the shoulders before us. We stand, we hold hands together and work together. Some of us have more initiative. Maybe some of us have more talent. A lot of us have more privilege. But it's that we build this together. That's what we've been lacking in the last how many years? 30 to 40 years. We came to believe we don't do things together. We cut down on government. We don't need regulation. Did I leave anything by the last time? I'm going to talk in a little more detail about what we did do in the last 30 to 40 years that was detrimental to our health. But why 30 to 40 years ago? Why did it happen? Somewhere Really, in the late 1800s, we began to generate a much more vibrant sense of what government should be. And I'm going to return to this near the end of uh, this talk. Uh, we did begin to pass legislation to protect workers. We developed a Federal Reserve.